Hello, my name is Drew Festini, and I'd like to talk about the feature of Linux on RISC V. And there's many links in these slides, so you can find them at that URL at the top there, tinyurl.com slash rv slash linux slash dus. So who am I? I design open source hardware projects for a PCB manufacturing service in the U.S. named Oshpark. I'm also on the board of directors of the Beagle Border Dog Foundation. You might be familiar with the BeagleBone. It's a small open source hardware Linux computer. I'm also on the board of directors of the Open Source Hardware Association. And we have an open source hardware certification program that you can find out more about on our website. And I'm also an ambassador for RISC-V International. So this is one of the great RISC-V meetups from around the world, and there's other ones in many other time zones, and you can find them all at community.riscv.org. And coming up in July is the RISC-V Forum for Embedded Technology. So sometimes when I give this talk, I go a lot into the basics of RISC-V, and since this is already a RISC-V meetup, I'm, I'm only going to focus on the parts that are kind of important for Linux. So with RISC-V, we have four base integer ISAs, and RV64 is the 64-bit one, and this is going to be most interesting for Linux. We also have standard extensions, and for Linux distros like Debian and Fedora, they're targeting RV64GC. So that G stands for general purpose, and it's equivalent to integer, multiply, atomic, float, and double float, along with C for compressed instructions, similar to ARM thumb. If you want to learn more about RISC-V, I highly recommend the RISC-V Reader. It's only about 100 pages. You can find it, it's available in several different languages and it's available and you can find out more at, at risc5book.com. So sometimes I get the question, is RISC-V an open source processor? And RISC-V itself is just a set of specifications under an open source license. And RISC-V implementations can be either open source or proprietary. But open specifications make open source implementations possible. So an open ISA like RISC-V enables open source processor implementations, which is something I'm really excited about. So in terms of uh, what Linux needs from a RISC-V system to run, an important part is the privileged architecture specification. So this provides three different privilege modes. At the bottom, we have machine mode or M mode, where our bootloader and firmware would run. And then we have supervisor mode or S mode where the operating system such as the Linux kernel would run. And then we have user mode or U mode where the applications would run. And then there's several different combinations that can be used. So a simple bare metal embedded system would just be M. An embedded system with memory protection would be M plus U. And then a full Unix style operating system like Linux with virtual memory would be M plus S plus U. So the RISC-V boot flow might look similar to what you find on an ARM SOC. We have a boot ROM, a first stage bootloader, and then U-boot that loads, the loads and jumps to the Linux kernel. But we have something new in the middle there for RISC-V, and that's SBI. So SBI stands for the Supervisor Binary Interface. So this allows supervisor mode software like the Linux kernel to be portable across all RISC-V implementations by defining an abstraction for platform specific functionality. So the supervisor execution environment or SEE handles SBI calls from the kernel is implemented by firmware executing in machine mode. So you can see how in this diagram we have the kernel running in S mode and it makes SBI calls down to M mode. So SBI is required by the Unix class platform specification. And soon this will be replaced by the RISC-V platform specification. I'll talk more about that at the end. Um, if you want to look at the discussion for both of these, it's on the tech Unix platform spec mailing list. So in SBI, we have several extensions. So starting off with the base extension, which basically allows us to query what version is it, which implementation is it, um, along with things like the machine vendor architecture and implementation. And then we also have the timer extension, the IPI extension for inter-processor interrupts, and the remote fence extension.
So OpenSBI is an open source implementation for the SBI spec. And the idea here is to avoid fragmentation by having layers of implementation. So we start off with a core platform independent SBI library that firmware or bootloaders can link against. And then also it can integrate with platform specific operations provided by firmware. It also is runtime firmware for supported platforms. And it replaces, you may see this in other places, the legacy RISC-V RISC PK bootloader, which is also known as BBL for Berkeley bootloader. So that's the old thing before OpenSBI existed. And then OpenSBI allows us to use well-known bootloaders such as U-Boot. And there's now a trend in OpenSBI to move away from having a new platform added for every new SOC and just use something called generic platform. So SBI also works with the hypervisor extension, which is currently in draft. Um, so we have an additional thing called the HS mode. So we'll have the guest kernel making SBI calls to the hypervisor in HS mode, and then that'll be making SBI calls down to the, to the machine mode or M mode. So SBI does have continuing releases. So the current release candidate is for version 0.03. In this adds, um, the suspend functionality is added to the heart state management, uh, which there's a little chart on the side here of how that works. There's also the performance monitoring unit function that was added and the system reset extension that was added so that you can fully reboot the system. So if you're not familiar with the term heart, it's a term used in RISC-V uh, to mean a hardware execution context. So this contains all the state mandated by the ISA, so the program counter and certain registers. So you, for example, you can think of an Intel CPU with two cores with hyper-threading on each. That would essentially be four hearts. So if we have a RISC-V processor with four hearts, you could kind of think of it as four cores in a, in a system that didn't have hyper-threading. Or in the context of Linux, if we have four hearts, we would have uh, four uh, schedulable processors, or we'd have four, four penguins when our system boots up. So um, RISC-5 also supports UEFI now, so support was added to the Linux kernel in 5.10. U-Boot and Tiano Core EDK2 both have UEFI implementations, and GRUB2 can be used as a UEFI payload. So there is full support for RISC-V and QEMU from both 32-bit and 64-bit, um, and you can pretty much um, do all the different draft specifications in it for hypervisor and vector. Uh, you can run OpenSBI, U-Boot, and Core Boot. You can even run the same binaries that you would on a physical board. And there's a nice tutorial from Michael Optenhacker Nacker at uh, FOSDEM 2021 um, that talks about how to build an embedded Linux system from scratch in 45 minutes using QEMU. So RISC-V support was added to the Linux kernel by Palmer Dablet in the back in Linux 415, which was um, several years ago. Um, there is the risk, the Linux dash risk five mailing list, which is the main place to see patches and discussions about the risk five support in the Linux kernel. Um, and there's the archive on lower.kernel.org that you can go back and read all the past discussions of. So last year, uh, Bjorn Topol, uh, gave an interesting talk at the Munich risk five meetup about what's missing in risk five Linux and how you can help. And he made the point that you know, the RISC-V architecture supported in Linux is still relatively new compared to other architectures. Um, so it's a great way to jump in and learn the nitty gritty details of the Linux kernel. And also because it's a relatively newer architecture, um, it's still a pretty small community. So it's a great, great time to get involved um, with, a, with one of the architecture communities in Linux. So if you run this shell script in Linux kernel source, it'll show you for each architecture the to-do list. So these are the current to-do items uh, that still need to be done for the architecture support for RISC-V and Linux kernel. So hopefully that might pique your interest to potentially get involved. 
Um, another thing to keep an eye on is there's there's continual work being at, uh, done to add new features and functionality. Um, and a lot of that is the way to keep track of that is from the mail list there. Um, so I highly recommend subscribing to the Linux Risk V mailing list if you want to keep up with go what's going on with the Linux kernel development for Risk V. Um, and to just talk about some of the um, work that's been done over maybe the last year or so um, for debug, trace, and security. So there's now support for the eBPF JIT um, for both 64-bit and 32-bit. Um, so we know that uh, eBPF is something we've seen a, a lot of um, new interesting applications uh, for beyond just networking in the Linux kernel. Um, and there's also now support for K-probes and K-rep probes, um, which will allow BPF trace to be used on RISC-V. There's also JUP label support, which reduced the overhead of debug and trace features. KGDB and KDB sorts also being worked on. Uh, KExec and KDump support as well. There's, there's also work being done on a 64-bit relocatable kernel, which will help uh, kernel address layout randomization for security be implemented in the future. Also, support for the syscaller fuzzer was added, um, and that's been helping to discover um, bugs in the kernel code for RISC-V. And also the K-fence, which is the kernel electric fence, which is a memory safety error detector, uh, supports being added for RISC-V as well. And each of these links here takes you to the mail list thread, so if you want to find out more, you can click on the link in the slides and uh, read the mailing list threads about these patches. Um, so in terms of hardware support, um, KVM support is essentially waiting on ratification of the hypervisor spec. Uh, there's also initial support being added for the vector ISA, which is another um, spec that's in draft. There is also support for SV48, which is four level page table implementation, which would allow up to 64 terabytes of physical memory. Um, and like bigger systems like Intel, there's also NUMA support um, that's being worked on as well for RISC-V. Um, as well for smaller systems, execute in place or XIP support, which allows us to run directly out of flash and reduce RAM usage. More recently, there's been CPU idle support um, added, which takes advantage of the, uh, that hard state management functionality in SBI and also support being added for some of the SOCs that have been coming out from Kendride and Microchip and Sci-5. So we do have support from, for RISC-V from Fedora, um, and the goal of the RISC-V Fedora project is to provide the full Fedora experience on RISC-V. And this has been in, works, been in the works for several years now, um, starting off with QEMU, and, and now it actually runs on real hardware. So you can actually go and grab um, at that installation instructions link there. You can go grab a Fedora image right now and run it in QEMU on your system. Um, but it also supports several of the RISC-V development boards that currently exist and will be coming out. Debian also has a port for RISC-V architecture. And you know, Debian is known for their massive collection of packages, and right now, 95% of those packages are being built for RISC-V. So if you don't need a full binary distribution like Fedora or Debian, there's also work being done uh, for RISC-V in Open Embedded in Yocto, and that's provided through the Meta RISC-V layer, which is essentially kind of a BSP layer for RISC-V, um, and that supports both QEMU and some real boards that have that have come out and ones that will be coming out in the future. And another way to build a uh, kind of your own Linux distribution, your own root file system, if you don't want a full binary distribution, is build root as well, and that has uh, full support for RISC-V and the upstream project. And as I mentioned earlier, there was a great presentation by from Michael at Bootlin about how to build an embedded Linux system from scratch in 45 minutes. And this is just using QEMU as the hardware, so you don't actually need any real hardware to go through this and build a full uh, RISC-V Linux system from scratch. So some of you may recall uh, a few years ago, um, Sci-5 came out with the Freedom Unleashed board, which is the first Linux-capable RISC-V dev board. Um, and it used a SOC from Sci-5 called the FU540. 
Um, and this was a lot faster than what people have been using previously, previously which was um, FPGA soft cores, which are just inherently slow compared to a real SOC. Um, and one thing to note is oftentimes people say ASIC when they're talking about a real um, hard core in an in a SOC instead of a soft core in an FPGA. Um, but this board was $1,000 um, and it's no longer available. Um, and the chip on it was never sold separately. And this is because Sci-Fi's core business is designing and licensing cores and not building SOCs or boards themselves. But the neat thing about the Unleash board was it showed us that we can actually run a full Linux desktop um, on RISC V, which was pretty neat to see. So this is a Fedora GNOME image uh, running on the Unleashed with a graphics card uh, plugged into it. So Microchip has the Polarfire SOC. So this is similar to the Sci-5 U540, but it adds a FPGA. So we have four U54 cores from Sci-5 um, along with the FPGA fabric, which can potentially make for some pretty interesting systems. And the other thing that's nice about this part is it's intended for full commercial availability. So um, the part itself is available from distributors. So you can build your own boards with the Polar Fire SOC. And Microchip produced the Icicle board is kind of the reference um, dev kit. Now this is half the price of the Unleashed and it is available from distributors. Um, so this has two gigabytes of memory on it and a built-in EMMC flash. But uh, due to the fact that it has a large FPGA integrated into the SOC, it, it does kind of have a, a higher price tag than what some people may want for a dev board. Now to go down to the really low end cost, we have the Kendry K210 which is a 400 megahertz dual core uh, RISC-V system. Um, and you can get a dev board for as cheap as $13. Um, and full support was added into Linux 5.8 um, by Damien Lamal and, and Christoph Helvig for this part. Uh, and it also has support in U-Boot from Sean Anderson. Now, one of the limitations of this board is it only has eight megabytes of SRAM. So, you can use build root um, to make a root of with BusyBox, um, and there is a nice tutorial on CNX software of how to do that. Um, and Damien Lamal, um, who helped port Linux to it, um, has an interesting uh, robot arm product project that he used this board with. Um, but with the eight megabytes of SRAM, it runs out really fast. Um, and the MMU in the system is based on a draft spec that's not supported by Linux. So we don't have virtual memory, which means we can't use like shared libraries like we normally would. So it's pretty limited in terms of the, the memory. But for $13, um, it's a really nice way to play around with some real RISC-V hardware that can run Linux. Now, uh, last year, Sci-5 announced the follow-up to the Unleashed, which is called the Unmatched. Um, so instead of $1,000, this one $665, so a little bit cheaper. It's also, it was available on CrowdSupply as well, and it's finally shipping now to backers, and then it'll soon be available from distributors as well. Um, so this has a new SOC in it called the FU740 SOC. So it also has four 64-bit RISC-V cores, similar to the other one, but just kind of the next generation of Sci-5 core design. And the really interesting thing about this board is it comes in a mini ITX PC form factor with eight gigabytes of memory. So and with USB 3 and gigabit ethernet, and it even has a PCI Express expansion port along with slots for an NVMe M2 drive or Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. So um, as shown in this picture here, you can actually have a full development workstation that's running natively on RISC-5, which is pretty neat. So Alibaba has a chip design division called T-Head, and they've designed a really high-end 16-core, uh, 2.5 gigahertz RISC-5 processor. It also implements the draft of the Vector extension, which is, I think, a, will be a really interesting way in which people will be able to um, do certain types of programming much better with the RISC-V uh, than with alternatives. Um, it's comparable in performance to an ARM Cortex-A73, so much kind of higher end than the previous cores that we were looking at. Um, there's an interesting paper last year from Hot Chips that talks about the design of the system and how they're currently using it in an FPGA implementation in some of the Alibaba data centers.
And Alibaba T had actually produced a test SOC called the C910 and they ported Android to it. So really neat thing that we have a RISC-V SOC with Android running on it now. Uh, and you can find out more information in that link there about the project. There's now a actually an Android special interest group from RISC-V International with um, people from uh, Alibaba and, and other organizations that are working on um, getting Android support better in RISC-V. Uh, so the, the evil board that you saw there is called the THAAD uh, ICE um, evaluation board. Um, so this is that C910 test SOC. So this has that 910 core, um, two of them, uh, and then actually I think three of them actually, uh, along with DDR4 and Gigabit Ethernet uh, and a GPU. Now this isn't, uh, the board and the SOC are not available uh, for sale now, but this was a really awesome proof of concept and we'll see where um, Alibaba T-Head goes from there with this um, system. And on the lower end, um, T-Head also has the C906 core. So this is a smaller um, in-order pipeline uh, that's just one gigahertz single core system. And this is being used in the recently announced all winner D1 SOC. So this is meant to be a, a low cost risk five single core SOC. And they've also produced the all winner. So all winner online has created the D1 development board called the Neza. Um, and this has the one gigahertz single core D1 in it, uh, along with DDR3 memory, um, Wi-Fi and Ethernet, uh, USB, uh, and several other peripherals as well. And one of the exciting things that was announced, uh, I believe, last month was that RISC-V International is starting a developer board program. So you'll be able to um, sign up and potentially get a Linux-capable um, dev board to work on your development projects. So. This was starting off with the all winner D1 board, um, but then eventually it'll be including other uh, other vendors boards like the Sci-5 Unmatched and the Icicle uh, and the Beagle 5 and some other ones as they come out. Um, the way to get started with this is you go and fill out the RISC-5 developer boards form. And the preference is for people to be members of RISC-5 International. So one thing to remember is that individuals can actually join free of cost. Um, so if you go to RISC-5.org, you can actually sign up uh, free of cost as an individual. And when you fill out this form, you need to explain um, what project you're wanting to work on and why you're interested in RISC-5. So for example, it might be that you want to ask RISC-5 support to a certain upstream open source project. So um, back in January, uh, Beagle Work Foundation, Seed Studio, and Star5 announced the open source hardware Beagle 5 Starlight Development Board, um, which features a 64-bit RISC-V SOC from Star5 that, act similar to the Icicle, or, or similar to the Unmatched Board, several, uh, features several U74 Sci-5 cores. Um, so the Beagle 5 Starlight board you see here, it has 8 gigabytes of memory, 4 USB 3 ports, um, 2 CSI ports for camera, DSI for display, HDMI, gigabit Ethernet, and Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. So back in April, we um, sent a limited number of board, uh, beta development boards to um, upstream developers from different open source projects such as Linux kernel and Uboot and OpenSPI to start kickstarting getting um, RISC-V support added in. And one of the really neat things was Thomas Petazoni of Bootlan added support to build root for the board in just 48 hours. So that was neat, neat to see. Niels wrote a really, really nice blog post about how he went through and added support in build root for a new RISC-V uh, SOC and board. And Kemraj also and some others also did a similar thing for the Red Meta RISC-V layer in Yocto and Open Embedded. And if you want to find out more, please join the public Beagle 5 forum group um, on our website, and you can find out more about the feature project product launch of the board. And if you have don't if you don't have any hardware at all, um, I would highly recommend Renode. So similar to QEMU, but more tailored towards specific boards, uh, Renode can simulate physical hardware systems, including the CPU, peripherals, sensors, and even wired and wireless networks between nodes. So if you go to the Renode website, you can see they have profiles for different boards, including that Hi5 Unleashed board that I was talking about earlier. 
So here's me on a train actually going to, I think, Embedded World last year um, from Berlin where I was living at the time. Uh, so I'm on the Deutsche Bahn and I'm simulating the uh, sci 5 Unleashed board using Renode on my laptop. And Renode now has support for the Beagle 5 Starlight. So even before the board comes out as a product, you can go and emulate the Beagle 5 Starlight on your laptop or workstation. So one of the things I wanted to go over in the end here is that um, there's the RISC-V Tech Groups calendar. So there's a large number of different working groups and committee meetings that members can attend. And remember that individual people and nonprofits can become members of RISC-V International free of cost. So if you're interested in some of the things I was talking about, one of the ways that I kind of stay involved and, and know what's going on is I like to try and attend some of these different um, working groups and committee meetings. And many of them meet on uh, either monthly or bi-weekly basis. So this is just a snapshot of the current um, calendar from June. Um, if you click on that link at top there, it'll take you to the Google Calendar where you can see all the different meetings that are going on. And I just wanted to go over some of the ones that are particularly of interest, I think, for people that are looking to do uh, Linux RISC-V systems. Um, and I mentioned back during the SBI section that, that, that that's a requirement for the Unix platform specification. Now that's kind of being overhauled into a new thing called the RISC-V platform specification. So there's the platform horizontal steering committee that is working to standardize the interface between hardware platforms and OS like Linux in, in the context of RISC-V. Um, so if you're interested in this, the agenda and minutes from, from the bi-weekly meetings are available online. Also, recordings for past meetings are available online as well, and they're really, uh, Kumar, who's the chair, is really good about recording them, um, since this might be a tough time zone for some people. Um, I have a link in there to the last meeting uh, slides, and the discussion for this happens on the TAC Unix platform spec mailing list. Um, so, just to give you a brief overview, so this draft platform specification has two different platforms defined. So there's OS-A, which is meant to be used for rich, full operating systems like Linux, and even has an optional server extension to talk about the things that a, a, a RISC-V server should have. And then there's the M platform, which is meant for bare metal applications or an RTOS, RTOS running on a microcontroller. And these are still in development, so if you're interested in this, both in terms of what you need as someone that's looking to use a system, or you want to make sure that you're including the right things in RISC-V systems that you're building, I recommend checking out the, the past meetings and hopefully attending in the future. Um, and kind of related to this, there's a new special interest group called the Advanced Interrupt Architecture. Um, and this is actually defining some new uh, hardware, so it's not ISA spec, but it's kind of a hardware, uh, a spec for hardware that complements it. So this includes a new platform level interrupt controller called the um, APLIC. And then for in the context of PCI, we, usually, we have what's called the message signal interrupt. So this adds the incoming MSI controller as well. Uh, there's a draft of the current spec, and then uh, I linked in the slides from the last meeting. And you can follow the discussion on this tech AIA mailing list. Uh, and also related to this, there's also, uh, so we have the, we used to have the PLIC and now that's being replaced with the APLIC. And then there used to be the CLINT for core local interrupter and there's now the advanced uh, CLINT that kind of replaces that. And it defines a set of memory map devices which provide um, interprocessor interrupts and timer functionalities for each heart on a multi-heart system. So like a multi-core system. Uh, there's discussion for that on the Unix platform mailing list. And there's even been uh, a Linux patch posted, uh, posted by a noob to give initial support for the ACLINT. And this is a chart from the last meeting um, of the AIA um, that kind of shows um, the different tiers of uh, platforms, uh, such as existing platforms or ones with wired interrupts or platforms with MSIs for PCI and then also wired interrupts and how uh, these different specifications fit into that picture. Now, I mentioned the draft of the RISC-V hypervisor um, earlier and how there's a, currently a patch set uh, that, that adds support for that in KVM, which is the, the virtual uh, machine that's part of the Linux kernel. 
Um, and recently, uh, Linux Weekly News, which is one of my favorite websites, uh, had a story about why RISC V doesn't yet support KVM. And I highly recommend reading this thread here from the Linux Kernel mailing list, um, which um, was sparked off by a new posting, the most recent uh, revision of the patch set. So the the gist of it here is that the Linux RISC V Arch maintainers only want to support frozen specs. But the there's been an unexpected delay from the RISC V International um, ISA group in getting the hypervisor extension frozen. So we have this tension here between um, people like Anoop that are carrying this patch set for like over a year plus um, that want to get it merged in, but then at the same time, the people like Palmer that are the RISC-V Arch maintainers in Linux, they don't really want to start merging in support for a spec that's not frozen yet. So there's not necessarily like a right or wrong answer here, but I highly recommend um, checking out this discussion if you're interested in that and seeing seeing how to, how um, hopefully we can find a compromise that balances both of those uh, sort of needs. Um, and this also outside of the Linux kernel mailing list has already, has also kind of reawakened discussion on the tech privilege mailing list around the uh, freeze of the H extension or the hypervisor extension. And kind of a, another similar thing uh, of kind of real world meeting uh, spec is uh, recently, um, there was a, a patch post in the Linux kernel mailing list about, um, about a vendor, Alibaba T had, that had added uh, custom page table attributes to handle not to, to handle peripherals that were not on a cache coherent interconnect. Um, so this was something where uh, we don't actually have, we did not actually have any capability in the RISC-V ISA for this, so the vendor had gone off and kind of come up with their best um, way of trying to add that capability. Um, and now we have that kind of uh, position where we need to figure out how to reconcile both what vendors are doing with real hardware right now and what we want the specification to be. Um, so specifically in this instance, um, there's an extension that's proposed currently called the page base memory types or PBMT. Um, so this was proposed on the tech vert mem mailing list. Um, so there's existing PMAs or physical memory attributes in RISC-V, but they're not sufficient for some platforms, such as a SOC that has um, peripherals on a non-cache coherent interconnect. So PBMT, or as you'll see formally, SVPBMT, uh, which is a bit of a mouthful, um, defines these different page-based attributes, which are more granular than the, the PMA. So, we have just normal memory, normal cacheable re region, uh, WB, and then we have NC, which is a non-cacheable region, and then we have UC, which is a non-cacheable IO region, which would be useful for things like DMA descriptors. Um, so the, the last meeting, um, uh, there I linked in the meeting minutes, um, the next one is coming up on June 23rd. So if you're interested in things like this, I'd highly recommend joining. Uh, the last meeting was, was quite interesting. Um, and there's not necessarily a right or wrong answer here, but um, there's a lot of good discussion around the different trade-offs and trying to, trying to find a compromise that works both with uh, what vendors have already done and what will work, what's kind of the, the ideal thing to do for the future. Uh, kind of another thing of like real world versus specification is um, cache management operations task group. So currently there's no methods in the RISC-V ISA for managing cache and coherency. So the CMO task group has proposed this extension that has a base of a base set of instructions in CSR, which are control and status registers. Um, so this allows essentially management of cache blocks. Um, so you can see some of the instructions there. Um, so this is still in the works in it probably won't be done anytime soon. So that brings up the question, well, what do we do about existing SOCs? Um, and for the short term, um, there's been a proposal to add a DMI synchronization extension to SBI. If you remember the nice thing about SBI is it kind of acts as that abstraction there between the operating system kernel and the specific uh, hard, uh, RISC-V hardware implementation. So we can potentially use that to leverage things like adding a, a DMI synchronization extension. And then the long term, once this uh, uh, CMO base extension is approved in the future, 
we can actually then go back and trap and emulate those new instructions in SBI. So if there's an unknown instruction that automatically traps into SBI, and then we can handle it in there. So that, that's another kind of longer term approach for these existing SOCs. So there's the tech CMO mailing list that has this discussion, and then the next meeting is coming up on June 21st. Um, so that's my tour of the future of Linux on RISC-5. Um, and I highly recommend, um, if you can, um, try and attend some of these working groups and committees. Um, I'll go back to that slide right here. Um, so the, the RISC-5 tech groups calendar. A um, lot of interesting development and discussion going on. Um, and hopefully there's something for everyone's area of interest. And I'll jump back here to the final slide with that tiny URL link there. Um, that'll take you to the slide uh, slides here with all the links. Um, so thank you for listening and happy to take questions. Which uh, will be uh, in the meetup and not in this video. <laughs> Bye.